So, um, now you'll see on the screen a prayer called the Seven Line Prayer of Guru Rinpoche. I don't think you're on yet. Hello, checking. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, you'll see on the screen shortly the prayer, Seven Line Prayer of Guru Rinpoche. First prayer, checking, checking. Our first prayer is praise to Shakyamuni Buddha. Teacher, Bo Destroyer, Thus Calm, Holy and Perfectly Awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, bond to bless, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, Supreme One, Teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, Bo Destroyer, Glorious Victorious One, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, <clears throat> fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, houseman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, nor of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who were wise at that time, I prostrate. 
completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate, endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate, protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the dust gone I prostrate. Your purity, free from attachment, your virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the dharma that brings peace I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing, and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create, by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness in the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined, I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth waves of your blessings. Vidam Guru Ratnam and Dalakam Nayati Yam. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling on massive vultures mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, 
beholding those five aggregates, also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no, no feeling, feeling, no discrimination, discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to, and including, no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to, and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration, without fear. Having completely passed beyond air, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth, since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared, we'll say at one time, and then uh, 20 times to ourselves. Thayata, gate, gate, par gate, parasam gate, bodhisattva. Taita, gate gate, par gate, par sam gate, bodhisattva. Chaiputra, the bodhisattva, mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the bodhisattva, mahasattva, arya, avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you've indicated. Even the Tathagata does rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivari Putra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. So, do you want to do the request for teachings? My apologies. My apologies, uh, my friends. My technology friends, I need the prayer to request teachings. It was there from a flash. <laughs> I don't know it by heart. I need your help. <laughs> Thank you, you so much. Sure. Yeah. Request to turn the wheel of Dharma. Lamala, to fulfill the needs of all beings of their various levels of understanding, we request that you turn the wheel of Dharma, including the lesser and greater common and extraordinary approaches. Thank you. This is kind of a tradition where um, Buddhists don't uh, formally teach unless they're asked to teach. Can you hear me in the back okay? All right. So it, it seems like we're doing a lot of religious prayers uh, to begin with, but from uh, 
Dharma point of view, there are narrative meditations that we do really fast. You, you could take any one of the, these smaller texts and that could be your entire narrative meditation. <clears throat> uh, Buddha Dharma, uh, even though it has a religious um, looking rituals, it really isn't a religion. It's a humanistic, highly humanistic uh, path of transformation. But coming out of India and Tibet and traditional societies, uh, it comes along with uh, strong devotion and strong uh, uh, energy and archetypal things and so forth that, of course, in the West, we'd identify uh, as religious. Um, and it comes right down to it, though, like uh, uh, it depends upon us and us alone to make progress on the path, doesn't it? Um, there's a famous poem I like to quote, maybe incorrectly <laughs> in translation, but uh, the Buddhas do not heal by laying on of hands. They do not wash away sins with water. They do not transfer uh, experiences or realizations. They only teach. The teaching lineage. So uh, it, it takes involvement and takes effort. So it's not a salvation religion. Sometimes we say Tara, uh, the saviorist, of course, because she comes so quickly. Um, uh, uh, that feminine quickness comes so quickly, but uh, still uh, we have to meet uh, Tara halfway, correct? We have to do the work ourselves. <clears throat> Uh, Buddha's last words, everyone should know because I bring up so often, but I, they are repeating, all composite phenomena are impermanent. Practice diligently, right? Effort, right effort, yeah. Right effort appears in the perfections. It, it appears in the Eightfold Path, the very last word, right? Buddha didn't say, don't worry, be happy. I like that too, Meher Baba. Anybody like as old as me remember Meher Baba? Yes, Tom. Cool. All right. Yes. <laughs> I was wanted. I always wanted one of those Meher Baba posters. I think I'll look for that on the internet now. You know, just smiling, great mustache. Um, that's okay to say. That would be fine. Many people, many um, wonderful teachers from all traditions have said important words, but. Uh, Particularly in our tradition, we emphasize uh, time and change and effort. So that's important, right? Didn't say anything religious, really. Can you dispute? Can anybody say, oh, things don't change? <laughs> yeah, we know that. And can anybody say, oh, everything just automatically happens? No, no, it does take effort. So we're here to teach about not just the right view, but um, the right practice and the right amount of effort. Not too hard or not too soft, right? So today, I um, uh, said to give a teaching on um, mandala. <clears throat> That's a big teaching. have an example of a really intricate mandala, the Kalachakra mandala, uh, Tanka uh, on this side here, and also, as people know, um, an outside mandala on the back of the building, right? As far as I know, I, uh, we're the only temple that actually has a, a mandala on the outside. Usually it's Usually temples don't have um, uh, mandals on the outside. Maybe uh, the paint would come off or something, but we have it on a piece of metal, right? <laughs> so it's not going anywhere. <clears throat> uh, I have a scholarly side to me, so uh, I'd like to talk about the sources and um, credit sources. So, uh, 
much of my understanding and practice of mandala, of course, has come through my teachers and um, uh, my first teacher, Trungpa Ramshe, actually, you know, uh, still has a book in print called Orderly Chaos, <clears throat> which I recommend. <clears throat> and um, there's also a lot uh, written on Kalachakra, Mandala, of course, and Dalai Lama on. Um, but also, uh, there's a scholar that, that I know personally have asked to teach it um, when I was in Nevada City, Ronald Davidson. And uh, I'll just hold up the book because I like holding the books. Let's see, can I show this? Yeah, this one, yeah. <clears throat> Um, I want to credit, you know, Elizabeth Zima with <laughs> Make, making these tabs, you know, so like, uh, <clears throat> it's helpful, actually, you know, um, one of the nice things about it is I, I don't write in books anyway, so this way I can write on the tab. So, you know, thank you, Elizabeth, for become a tabber. I call them flying tabs, you know, kind of like this. <laughs> I'd like to read actually directly from, from Ron's work because um, he's so succinct that why paraphrase it. <clears throat> from the book, Indian Esoteric Buddhism, A Social History of the Tantric Movement. Doesn't that sound grand? <clears throat> it's from a section called Mandalas in the Field of Plenty. If the critical investigation of esoteric Buddhism has been hampered by an excessive emphasis placed on the post-enlightenment doctrine of spiritual temporal duality, perhaps this is most evident in the study of mandalas. The idealization of the mandala has become part of popular culture parlance in Europe since the time of Carl Gustav Jung's absorption of early medieval Indian and related Tibetan or Japanese forms of religious iconography. Yet Jung, even though so affirmative on these visual representations, warned of the actual study of Asia. Since Jung, many scholars have been seduced by his explicit Gnosticism which maintained that the spiritual plane influences mundane reality and not the reverse. While we may be sympathetic with one raised in the atmosphere of religious strife in and around 19th century Switzerland, we cannot afford to emulate Jung's disinterest in the historic development, form, and employment of mandalas since the second half of the seventh century. Institutional Buddhist esotericism in particular can both accept the credit and bear the responsibility for the development of the meditative mandala form. Mandalas are implicitly and explicitly articulations of a political horizon in which the central Buddha acts as the Raja de Raja in relationship to the other figures in the mandala. In their origin and evolution, religious mandalas represent a Buddhist attempt to sanctify existing public life and recreate the meditator as the controlling personage in the disturbing world of Indian feudal practice. <clears throat> um, Professor Davidson's uh, main thesis is that um, what we know as Pantic Buddhism uh, arose as a response to uh, social and political upheavals uh, in, in India, <clears throat> um, that it wasn't just um, the Buddha teaching Tantra, which we can accept in a trans-historical way, or um, monks and nuns sneaking off to the jungle to learn uh, Tantra, but that it was a very conscious attempt to try to keep Buddhism relevant and uh, powerful in uh, a disintegrating political uh, and social situation. His reference to Jung is that uh, 
very good point is that uh, Jungian thought and psychological thought and uh, new age thought and much religious thought is kind of like things come from the mind and then the uh, material world is secondary, right? Mind's primary form is secondary. Actually, this is a reductionist point of view, right? It's kind of like everything is mind. Modern science is a little bit reductionist on the other side that everything is just brain chemistry, right? And that mind is an epiphenomena. But the point that uh, Ron's trying to make is that it's an interaction between people's awareness and the actual situation that they find themselves in. So the mandala um, from this point of view is uh, a recreation of the ideal Indian state, the ideal governance uh, before uh, things disintegrate or a way for things to be brought back into balance. And uh, his uh, book is quite uh, uh, convincing. I think maybe a couple of people in the outer audience may have, may have actually read it um, in the past. Maybe Dirk, I don't know. <laughs> Not yet, he's saying, oh, I haven't read it yet. Okay. <clears throat> Um, Ron's an old um, Nyingma friend uh, that I knew in uh, Nevada City in Berkeley. <clears throat> Meditator also. <clears throat> the monastic system that um, was going on in medieval India uh, depended and still depends upon a very stable social system, right? It, it's even though it's somewhat uh, rejection of uh, regular commercial society or regular warring society, it still depends on regular benefactors, right? You know, because monks and nuns weren't, you know, running. They weren't running a business out of the monastery. Hopefully, but increasingly as uh, uh, different uh, competing groups, Shaivite groups or Muslim groups came in that uh, the rise of the Mahayana movement, our movement, uh, recognized that we have to relate and teach and make some kind of um, attempt to uh, help and enlighten uh, the outside world, that we had to go outside the monastery bounds or outside, leave the cave and go out into the marketplace. So if we're going to go out there, how are we going to teach? <clears throat> how are we going to help? And then also, uh, how are we going to create a compassionate and just society that can support uh, everybody and particularly support meditators? <clears throat> So uh, Ron Davidson's uh, thesis is that um, the tantric practices we do that uh, are largely around creating uh, ideal society and the images and metaphors and archetypes of uh, an ideal uh, community or state um, is a response to um, chaos. So that's one reason Trump Permshi's book is called Orderly Chaos, like that. If we're paying attention to the news, uh, we should be aware that we live really in an age of real chaos. We can ignore it and just do our practice, do our training, but uh, those of us who've taken bodhisattva vows uh, are interested in being of some help, uh, recognize that um, we, we have to speak to the current situation so there are a couple of uh, aspects of mandala practice. The mandala practice as a yogic practice is to help us to achieve our own inner balance. 
but the mandala practice in a big way is to help us achieve a balance between uh, the inner and outer world uh, so that our in-between world our middle world becomes uh, very large and very balanced and very workable that's called the middle way so when uh, people are when we respond on an individual basis like we're responding to people affected by uh, current events uh, by shootings and so forth we want to comfort others we want to be present on an individual basis for people that have been affected either directly or secondarily as we have but also uh, from the mandala perspective bodhisattva perspective we want to say how do we create an environment where we this doesn't happen again how can we create an environment where we're going to dialogue with people that um, uh, you know, have different views. It's difficult, right? So, you know, when I think myself, I go, okay, how I can work with my own sense of upset, right? But how, how then, if somebody says, well, how would you, how would you fix the country or something like that? Then, then it gets a little trickier, right? Then we need some kind of mo model. Because so our individual practice dealing with other individuals has one aspect, but if we said, okay, how do we create a, a nonviolent society, then it's tricky, don't you think? <laughs> so the, um, the mandala image, the mandala vision uh, is a Buddhist attempt to not only work with our own uh, inner world and personal world and others' personal world, but also a um, very strong attempt to work with creating uh, a model, giving us a model to work with a compassionate, uh, lively, but nonviolent society. Like that. Primarily, uh, young and uh, which I like, but um, they're dealing with an inner experience, right? It's not, a, it's not seen as a way to actually run a Dharma center or run a country or run a world. But uh, the full mandal experience is both personal, interpersonal, and society, all three. It's primarily a skillful means. So uh, it's possible to say, okay, we don't, we don't need to use this form or this structure but uh, uh, I found that it's very helpful in my life, and I found that it's very helpful um, for refugees. It's really amazing that uh, after being invaded and uh, taken over between 1950 and 59 by communist China, uh, the Tibetans um, refugees have been able to reestablish themselves. So uh, particularly in India, but around the world, right? It's really interesting uh, to be in India, which is very poor and uh, in general, except for the very rich and is very poor and Tibetans have generally not, never met a wealthy Tibetan, They've gotta be some um, here or there, but these huge universities and huge retreat centers, it's unbelievable. So, uh, how, how are they doing it? It's not just devotion. It isn't just um, trying to reestablish a society. It's because there's, there's actually a model to do it. So I want to stop here for a moment. Uh, I want to get into some details of mandalas, but um, see if uh, I'm speaking in a way that people can hear. <laughs> or interested in, and if there are any comments or questions or clarifications or complaints. <laughs> Ellen, there, good, hi. Um, the, you know, from a scholarly point of view, so kind of from a uh, uh, tradition point of view, of course, 
Buddha taught mandalas very right away, but in secret, right? But from Western historical point of view, um, we, we don't really see mandalas showing up until like, uh, you know, definitely after um, the Parinirvana of the Buddha, maybe, you know, six, seven, eight hundred years later. The scholars just, you know, they're going on, um, you know, written materials, which are few and uh, statues and uh, writings and things like that. So, you know, what, where's the evidence that suddenly, you know, Tantra and Mandala start showing up at some point in India? So there are different ways to explain this. And uh, historically, we would explain it as the world was ready or the Buddha taught Tantra in secret and um, then it was the right time for them for it to be evolved or uh, people got curious and uh, went into the jungle and you know, met Dikinis and wonderful female teachers. But uh, Ron's making the point that it's also very much um, a conscious um, uh, political skillful act as far as um, Buddhist teachers went to create something meaningful. Like here's how we should Here's how we should run society, which should be run like this. Using existing um, images and existing terminology that uh, Indians would understand at the time, which, which is using the, um, the metaphors and the definitions based on royalty, but redefining them, just like the Buddha uh, would redefine a lot of the, or almost all of the yoga terms of the day, redefine what it meant to be a Brahmin, right? So you'd say, he wouldn't say there's no such thing as the Brahmins or the Brahmins are wrong. He'd say, the true Brahmin is someone that follows a path of compassion. The true Brahmin is someone that follows the Eightfold Path like that. True, you know, the Arya truths like that. Yeah, good question. Hi, Paul. Um, one moment, uh, Paul. People are uh, practices that call chakra. Oh, oh. Um, the, like the call chakra mandala is associated with the call chakra practice. Are right. all tantric practices have mandalas or is that part of their practice? Yes, every, everybody has a mandala. Yeah, I'll get into that. That's a good question. Yeah. That's, and that's the Zima in the back. And then we'll get the Zoom. <clears throat> So if these were a pattern for creating order in a chaotic society, is this something we could look at as a way of, as a pattern, as an entry into uh, mandala uh, diplomacy? Yeah, mandala diplomacy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I can't cover everything about mandalas today, but I'm, I'm starting off not from the internal psychological or internal uh, training aspect of mandalas, but uh, talking about mandalas from the standpoint of how to set up society. Like, uh, I, don't, I don't know how we do American society, except I went, you know, we all had like junior high and high school civics and you have all this and this is the way society is supposed to run, right? We have that, there's some kind of model like that. Um, uh, sometimes it seems not very explicit or sometimes it is explicit and people have that model in their head now about how we should do things. Um, and uh, 
the Buddhists coming out of India and onto Tibet had a model too, and it's it's a mandala model. And someone uh, someone else had a question in virtual land. No. Yes, I have a question, Lama. Okay. Charlotte. Uh, <clears throat> When you talk about mandala practice, can you expand on what exactly you're saying? I mean, obviously the Kala Chakra is a practice that has a mandra, mandala associated with it, but what do you mean by the, the general term mandala practice? The general term mandala practice is um, uh, how, you know, we, uh, are uh, an interdependence of the inner world and the outer world and the in-between world. That's the whole mandala. Okay, thank you. Just, just like I say, like in couple therapy, there's, <laughs> there's me, yeah. there's you, and then there's the relationship, right? <laughs> Like, are you talking about the relationship or are you talking about him? Are you talking about, you know, the marriage or are you talking about this? You know, so uh, the full mandala is both the outer world um, that's uh, everyone can see objectively. It's the inner world that people can't see generally unless we tell them. And then there's the in-between world, which is the world of relationships. So the, the full mandalas, the, those three things. Um, sometimes in, uh, it's translated like a, 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 a outer, inner, and secret. And, uh, and sometimes uh, in Dzogchen we'd say, um, you know, uh, super secret. <laughs> Uh, when I was studying with Choji Rimshe, um, I said, well, what's, you know, what's the uh, super secret? And he goes, well, it wouldn't be if I told you. So, <laughs> like that. yeah, but there is, uh, there is uh, definitely a deep aspect of uh, the way things are where we can't, we can know it, but we can't say it, right? You have to, you have to be able to, you can't quite share it the way we can even share a feeling. So the, this inner outer and in between world or relationship world is set up um, basically like a circle with a center and a circumference. And uh, the, uh, this constant communication between the center and the circumference is uh, how it works. Uh, so uh, using historical metaphors in the center is uh, a Buddha of uh, some form and uh, the Buddha is in a uh, uh, mandala uh, palace or mansion and then various uh, activities um, are represented in, in the mandala, just like here. And, um, you know, lotuses and rings of fire and different uh, things like that, denoting different symbols. Like the mandala you see in the wall is, is an aerial view, right? <clears throat> but the basic principle is that uh, the structure uh, is center and uh, edge, center and circumference um, are interdependent. Usually we don't see things that way. We see I, I'm, I'm in the center and other people really are way out there. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, yeah good. Um, oh, so are we, so it seems like we're all part of your mandala, your temple, <clears throat> and 
so if everyone has a mandala, then I would have a mandala with would be like my friends, my coworkers, my family, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That's correct. And there's there's that that we can talk a personal mandala, your personal kind of way, your experience is organized. Yes. Where it gets interesting though is everyone else has their own mandala. That's correct. And so we're all having all these mandalas. That's correct. At the same time. But then there's uh, the mandala principle in a big way is is how we uh, those work together and organize together. Okay. Because if there weren't anybody else, there wouldn't be any problems, right? <laughs> so, like, uh, it's a little bit like Sartre's no exit, right? So, <laughs> like no exit, you know, people are sitting in there and um, uh, uh, I like existentialism, so uh, but it's relevant. So in no exit, uh, it doesn't mean we can't get out of the escape room in Davis or wherever we like to play. It, it means that you, we can't stop objectifying people, even though we don't want to be treated as an object, right? Everybody wants to be a subject, right? We don't want to be objectified and you know, pushed out or made into a thing, right? <clears throat> uh, we all want to be treated as a subject, as like a person. Mm -hmm. um, but Sartre's uh, idea is that he doesn't know a way we can break out of that dynamic that we're condemned to objectify others. In other words, we're condemned to see that the, um, the outside the circumference of the circle is different than the center. So the mandala approach is that there is an exit. We don't have to see others as objects. Obviously that comes out most dramatic, you know, when there's a shooting, like they're not real people, they're objects, right? So what, what's it, what is it like when we don't see the world, uh, people or even objects as uh, outer objects, but as interrelated and what it looks like, it looks like a mandala visually and energetically, it, it feels like a mandala. In other words, there's a balance of energy and a constant communication between, uh, uh, a center and a circumference. This constant communication between what uh, you know is uh, what we're aware of, and the world is talking to us, and we're kind of talking to it, and we're the whole thing. So uh, generally, it uh, feels on a general way. You know, we always feel like we're some somehow in. <laughs> in here, like behind our eyes, doesn't it seem that way? <laughs> and then uh, some other people are, you know, if we're not totally solipsistic and narcissistic, we'll grant that there are other people that also feels that <laughs> Greg will Vicky's on that. Uh, but uh, Buddhism is saying uh, that that is not actually the way things are. It doesn't mean we give up our personal mandala or a sense of individuality, but uh, the uh, connection uh, you know, is uh, the primary thing. In other words, the in-between is the primary thing. In-between is the center world. So uh, when we say the center, it really means the in-between world. And then the in-between world uh, then can go out and relate with the objective world, people that believe that things are objective, uh, people are objects, and we can communicate with them. That's the problem, right? So when we're trying to communicate to ourselves, we're usually objectifying ourselves. I like myself, I don't like myself, I'm this way and that way. And then we objectify others and it becomes difficult to communicate, right? So the mandala principle is you're putting yourself in the center and in the center, as I said, is relationship. And on either side or on the, the perimeters of the circumference uh, is um, uh, the activity and the necessary objectification that we recognize as objectification. Because we have to say, well, those people, we have to say they live over there. <laughs> They're doing that. We have to say that, right? 
to form things, but we're not confused about it. Just like in our shamatha practice, um, we, we want to be in the middle, right? Balanced, present, clear, and the two polarities are uh, anxiety and depression, right? So we train ourselves to see we're getting a little bit too excited, too anxious, or are we getting a little bit too dull and depressed? We want to be in the middle. So right away, if people are studying with me, you're learning hopefully the Bandala principle right from the very beginning. We're just not calling it that. <clears throat> Let me stop here again. <laughs> Lama, are there are there actually are there actually two separate worlds, an objective world and a subjective world? Not really. <laughs> If we go it, look for it, uh, of course, we can't find it as an object. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, probably my, um, uh, my, most, my most comfortable philosophic stance is, uh, you know, like Chantarakshadas, who came um, first and then called his friend Guru Rinpoche, right? So, Shantarakshadya is a, a, a kind of a Madhyamikan as far as like uh, absolute reality and with relative reality is like a Swatantrika Yogacharan, right? So uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, we, and maybe we have to read Shantarakshadya with um, uh, Nipam Rimshay's commentary like that. So we do talk about absolute and relative reality. The way things appear is relative. The way they actually are is absolute, but they're not, they're not separate, right? Mm. Part of what prompted that question was the reading that you did from Dr. Davidson. Yeah. Because his criticism, at, if, unless I misunderstood what you read, but uh, I, I, I heard him criticizing Jung as coming from a dualistic viewpoint. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I think his, uh, I mean, if we're kind of being uh, totally scholarly, we might say his, his viewpoint was a little dismissive, <laughs> but um, I, I think he's, you know, very, he's very polemic in his book of trying to uh, not um, see uh, Vajrayana or Tantra as some kind of natural spiritual outgrowth, but as um, intimately tied to the, um, intimately tied to the times like that. But um, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen Ron for many years, so I, I don't know uh, if his views have changed since the book, you know. For all, for all I know, he may have gone into um, Jungian analysis. You know, we don't know. <laughs> like that. Yeah. Hi. You, you need that. You, you need, yeah. Yeah. Your question is important, so we want to, we want to hear it. So, am I on? Okay. You are on. So my question is: It sounds like you're saying that mandala, mandala, is a representation of in of a, of an individual, and it, it's like we're in that, and those things are all ideas and realities that we deal with. And my, you know, I don't know if I'm hearing that right, but my question, and I'm, I'm glad you brought this up, is that those things exist in American Indian cultures. And some of those American Indians came from Alaskan Indians who came from Tibet. And I don't know what their meanings are. I'll have to go research that now, uh -huh. I'm interested. But in, in American Indians, when they make that, um, well, in the Mayans, the center of it would be the king. And, and it was like, again, a singular person and their relationship to everything else. Uh -huh. But in American Indians and the ones that, that I've studied, 
it doesn't mean that. Every geometric shape and every thing that's, and there'll be so many things representative mm. and, and they mean something. Yeah. But what the whole thing meant was that it's like looking at a map of the universe. Everything's moving, but everything's related. Everything's connected. Everything affects everything else. So they can say, this on the outside is our people. And what's outside of them controls them or in, influences them. And they influence all this stuff and smaller and smaller and more and more details. And it's, it all means something. But basically what it means is that it's all one thing. We are all one thing. All of this works together as one thing. But that, that sounds like a different concept than what you're... Uh, you got my concept talking. totally wrong. But, uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Buddhist tantric idea is more like how you imagine uh, Native American would be. I, I can't remember your name, I'm sorry. Hi, Pat, good to see you again. Yeah, yeah no, the, uh, the idea of the visual representation is that this is the universe, which includes uh, both the personal and transpersonal world. So this is, it's just, this is the way it works. It's just like that, Pat, yeah. Well, your pers our personal world is still connected with, uh, you know, the whole thing, right? We're not, we're not outside of it, you know? So I personally experience gravity, but it's not my personal gravity, right? <laughs> like that. So a lot of times we're stuck in the personal world, which is like our personal gravity. I've got gravity. You mean other people have gravity too? I don't know. I'm not sure. Or, you know, but actually, you know, so uh, the realization is our personal sense of <laughs> we're feeling heavy and stuck to the ground uh, is universally, you know, we have our own personal private experience of it, but everyone's having that experience also. So gravity's for everybody on the planet, like that. So um, the mandala principle uh, talks about things from our own private or personal world, but also from the shared world. So it's relationships. Yes, sir. My name is Wilson. Hi, Tom. I've never been here before, but if any good is me. Now, the reason <laughs> I'm calling. You're still I, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I'm enjoying it. No, okay. Now, the reason I, 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 I'm asking a question is, so this is saying, this is representative of everyone's individual mandala, and the individual mandalas are, in a way, what keep us from getting along, like, you know, why people are polarized, maybe? Uh, no, that's not it. No, it's not. Okay. No. So uh, we could talk about, like, the... Um, Unenlightened mandala, like trunk perm she sometimes do that. The the way the, the way things uh, the pattern of how things screw up. Okay. But uh, generally today I've just been talking about actually the way things are. Okay. So it's not personal versus relationship or personal versus universal. It's okay. All, it's all together, just like we're all, we're all sitting here with gravity together. Right. And we all have our individual experience of it, but it's not in conflict. Okay. Like, I I, I'm not going to take your gravity from you and you're not going to get more gravity from me, you know? Right. So the gravity metaphor extends to love and awareness and yes. uh, enlightenment and so forth. Okay. I, I apologize. Then. That's a good, no, like, thanks for showing up and asking questions. So that's, this is what we do here. Thank you for your talk. It's been very interesting. Good. So I have a question about this idea of like integration between the three different um, concepts that you talked about, yeah. you know, internal and external, particularly. Yeah. It seems like in meditation, it's very easy to feel, you know, calm and relaxed. Then all I have to do is open my eyes and look at the world, and it's all gone. Yeah. So how do we how do we integrate this? 
that's why you have to do the mandala practice because we we have to shift uh we have to be able to shift back and forth between perspectives um and notice how we do that so there uh um the reason why we have to get together as a sangha as a group is because if we just sat in our own cave or own house um we you know we wouldn't get feedback or pushback right we wouldn't have to um see how to adjust it so the we have a template we can meditate on you know you could actually meditate visually on a mandala or meditate visualizing it internally you know but um we have to enact it uh, in our relationships with with people that are interested in doing that. So um, it, it's always a, a blast of the objective world when uh, you know somebody gives me some feedback or it says, oh, you're like this. And uh, I, I don't see myself that way at all, right? So I could easily dismiss that person going, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm me and I know me and you don't know me. So like that. But actually that's the objective world showing up. So if somebody says, oh, you know, like, I like this, or I don't like this, or this way, um, I could agree with it, but um, sometimes their best friends are the ones that, uh, you know, say something that as objectifies us, right, uh, that we don't agree with, and then we get to see how that objectification process happens, and then to, um, you know, bring our awareness to it. <laughs> so we have to we have to have others you know this this no we can't we can't have the the full the full experience um you know going solo like that so um you know people are annoying and dangerous um but also necessary <laughs> Hi, thank you for bringing the shooting into today's discussion, because I think this is on everybody's yeah. minds. Um, and, you know, it's interesting to hear about the, how the mandala concept was developed in response to um, strife that was occurring at the time. And certainly we're seeing a lot of strife now. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't help but think that these this kind of imagery and, and way of working with things was a little more familiar to the culture in which it arose. <clears throat> and then for us, we're familiar with the imagery and kind of putting it into practice into the real world. But how can we share, you know, the concept of mandala um, or put it into practice in our real lives that makes us feel like we are making a step in the right direction towards <clears throat> ending school shootings because clearly if people felt that they were in a mandala that they probably wouldn't go shooting at schools <laughs> things like that so you know what are some practical ways we can enact this um in a on a level that makes a difference in our community perfect timing to ask that question <laughs> so, uh uh what happens in the center of the in-between world and ultimately the whole mandala is that the in-between world is imagination. So imagination is this in-between, uh, you know, uh, objectified reality and fantasy. So imagination is where uh, we can make changes and make adjustments uh, and deal with the change that comes up. So, um, you know, I can pretty much say that, uh, you know, the young man that committed this terror um, was, was out of touch with imagination and literalized his world, right? So he had to literally act it out instead of kind of like imaginatively being able to work with being bullied or imaginatively being able to work with uh, anger or so forth like that. So that's why, um, you know, the arts um, uh, and the imaginative expressions are so important. Um, there are religious imaginative expressions and 
you know, we see we see imaginative expressions on the walls or uh, beautiful imaginative expressions, um, you know, cathedrals and things like that, right? Um, so uh, I like I like imaginative expressions. So uh, touching. So like uh, back in the video, uh, you call it a booth. I don't know, but uh, there's a, a tanka hanging over. That's uh, uh, kind of a little crush there, and uh, uh, the Saint James, uh, you know, left uh, a nice Madonna poster actually. So uh, we couldn't save the whole poster, but I saved the central image. So uh, it, it's in my, you know, up high in my office at Middle Way Health. Because that, you know, the image of uh, uh, mother caring for a child is the central image. That, um, you know, it's an imaginative image and a real image that has to be, you know, uh, fostered. So at some point, uh, you know, that person uh, that young man was no longer able to bring up any kind of imaginal image that, you know, got in touch with, you know, his own self-compassion or love or, or forgiveness, right? Had to enact everything. So that's why um, uh, we have to combine both uh, uh, the recognition nature of the mind, which recognizes things as open and non-solid and precise, and at the same time, the imaginative side, which brings about the proper form, the proper energy delivery, because energy is delivered through um, these, these forms, you know, whether they're visual forms or blood vessels or <laughs> chakras or whatever like that. So that those two things go together. And usually people err on one side or another, they become very literalized, right? And, um, I call that water bowl wars. <laughs> when people get stuck on ritual, like the way the altar looks is supposed to be like this and it's supposed to be like that. And if you don't do it that way, you're bad, stupid and wrong, you know? So that's literalizing, right? Um, being too much into just complete uh, non-form or uh, Dharmakaya mind would be like, it's stupid to have um, an altar, it's stupid to have paintings, right? You become kind of an iconoclast, right? Uh, so, you know, of course, this was a big um, uh, struggle, uh, you know, in Europe and also in Asia too, you know, between iconoclastic approaches uh, to spirituality and uh, icon approaches, right? So, uh, uh, definitely Tantric Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, and all of Buddhism really is, is into images, right? Um, like, uh, like Christianity. And uh, so there's a strong bond between the two because of that. Um, so, it, it, uh, you know, even recently we saw the, the large three-story, four-story high Buddhists in Afghanistan who were destroyed by the Taliban, right? Because they didn't believe in images like that. So images or the imagination is a conveyor of uh, energy, whether and the whole body and the situation is um, regarded as like living image. So the, the tankas here that are blessed and then they become kind of um, bodies for the uh, spiritual energy like that. <clears throat> You know, I don't know much, as much about orthodoxy as uh, Greg does, you know, but um, that, that's my understanding that the, the icons amongst blessed are, are more than just um, paintings, right? Yeah. <sighs> okay. A power. Yeah, have the channel power, have power, or not, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, no, that's important. So art, that's why I like to say art saves lives. So, uh, you know, video journalists save lives, right? 
Okay, we have a few more questions now. Good. Oh, yes. Matt. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you again, Lama. Yeah. Much appreciated. Sure. I was wondering about uh, maybe an extrapolation from individual relation to the Sangha and then also to, like, as a mandala, and then, and then for that as a wider frame afterward. So, like, with the kind of interactions and structures that we try or do maintain here, and if that is a, I don't know, useful way of thinking about it when trying to to make it uh, larger or bigger or greater or whatever word. Is it a useful way of thinking about it or? Uh, like expanding the vision or something? Yes. Um, that's, that's one aspect, you know. Um, uh, one of the powers, you know, is expansion, but um, Actually, you know, the, there's another way. We don't have to become bigger to make an impact. You see, uh, we can make an impact through um, small, but with lots of connections. Oh. Right. A little bit of a model. Yeah. This. Yeah. So the, the, yeah, the model is we have, we have to do our individual work and then we need the relationship work and uh, we need to mow the grass and take care of things. So uh, overall, um, one way of talking about the practice of the path um, that uh, Pato Rinpoche and Deepak Rinpoche talked a lot about was uh, you know, view, meditation, action, and conduct, right? So, uh, you know, the conduct is, uh, um, you know, not just how we live our lives, but we can say, what, what are you actually doing? <laughs> you know, uh, like that, you know, overall, what the whole thing. So, um, uh, my main teachers have always been meditators, but also highly involved in the world. Um, so um, uh, that's why I have kind of little different organizations um, for clarity, like fundamentally, uh, this, this Buddhist setting is, is meditative and uh, practice oriented. Um, and we've done social service things, but uh, I think social service project is um, in a middle way health foundation right or practical you know practical compassion so uh, my teacher would always go well uh, how's that making any difference <laughs> he was kind of difficult sometimes to go well how is that making any difference in your marriage <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know I understand emptiness, but what's on him? So, like that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, with the teachers we've brought here, and my emphasis is, you know, we we want to have a practical compassion, which does take vision, and it does take internal strength, and it, it does take, um, you know, understanding of cause and effect. But we we do want to make some kind of uh, practical impact, right? The Buddha was very practical. He did a lot of um, social work kinds of things and mediation kinds of things and talked to the power brokers of the time, the Rajas. He was deeply upset with the uh, horrific uh, wars and tribal wars that were going on. It wasn't, I, I don't believe it wasn't just like, you know, the myth kind of story is that he got a little tired of um, uh, the luxuries of palace life, perhaps, but uh, I think, uh, you know, he got really, really upset with the constant death and warring and um, horror he saw. Yep. 
la la la. Yes. We need that mic. Andrew has the last question. Make it a good one. <laughs> oh, so I have test, 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 test. Okay. Um, I had a metaphor come to me that I'm ready for you to poke holes in. Pardon me? <laughs> I said I had a metaphor come to me for this idea of the self, the other, and then the um, relational space in between. Uh huh. Um, I'm ready for you to kind of tell me how out of left field it is, but um, I was thinking about neuroscience and neurotransmitters and um, how one neurotransmitter, say that's us, that's the, the self, uh, transmits the impulse uh, to the next neurotransmitter, which can represent others. And then there's the synaptic cleft in between. And that's where the the stuff hangs out, the, the neurotransmitters. And as we know, like if there's not enough, it can lead to things like depression and things like that. Or, but um, we see these as individual neurotransmitters, but they're so interconnected. Um, it's not a linear, it's more of a circular, right? And it's, it's what everything is based on movement. We wouldn't be moving if these weren't communicating with each other. So it all makes part of, it's like a mandala, an entire entity that is made up of these, these kind of three parts, if you will. I don't know if that fits or not here. Uh, I've got a strong geek side. So, you know, I like uh, Abhidharma and neuroscience stuff. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, the current thinking is actually, there's no, uh, you know, we're not talking so much about different brain areas as coordination of functions, right? Like that. So that's similar to the model idea is that there's um, this uh, relationship that um, happens between, you know, we have to use that term between polarities um, and there's traveling involved, but uh, uh, there's, no, there's no fixed center. It's the center of gravity. So, um, uh, you know, my old Zen teacher used to say, Buddha is the center of gravity, says so like Roshi, right? So I said, well, this, like, this mala has its own center of gravity, and this pen has its own center of gravity. But uh, when, when they're together, then they share the same, same center of gravity. So it's, it's uh, paradoxical, but everybody has their own center of gravity and shares the same center of gravity at the same time. And there's no fixed uh, centralizing um, uh, entity. The, the whole thing is alive like that. <clears throat> I, I, a little bit what Autumn brought up is like, are, are these um, uh, uh, Pala dynasty, <laughs> Gupta dynasty, Indian, medieval Indian images and archetypes, are, are they useful for us now? Um, so, you know, uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about Buddhists with all kinds of different arms and um, using, um, uh, you know, royalty terminology like that, because, um, uh, you know, some royalty has sometimes gotten us in trouble, right? Um, when I was involved with Trungpa Rinpoche, there was discussion like, well, should all the Buddhas uh, be wearing three-piece suits, right, or something? Of course, that was patriarchal, right? Everyone thinks that way. Or maybe uh, Dakini should be wearing, you know, party dresses, you know. But um, that was, uh, that didn't happen. One advantage of um, having images slightly different um, is that uh, hopefully we're not going to literalize them as much. So, I really don't want you running into Tara, you know, at Whole Foods. Okay. <laughs> so if you do, okay, we want to talk about it. So <laughs> she's there. <laughs> no, no, she, she hangs out at, you know, grocery outlet. She doesn't go. It's too expensive. Yeah. Um, so 
uh, even if we, you know, so the, the imaginal aspects um, are, have power and have manifestation, but um, they don't exist as, as separate beings. Uh, so all, all the different, uh, they don't operate as, as gods, right? They're not separate beings. But images that uh, we work with and energies in the universe uh, do have function and effect. So that's what we're after. But uh, at some point we have to bring um, uh, the metaphors of uh, in, into our daily life. And that's, that's why we do um, the Salong practice to really bring it into our body. And um, uh, I talked with Patty earlier about uh, holding a class in the afternoon on, on mandala, how to actually uh, meditate and, and enact mandala uh, like that. But actually you guys are enacting it right now. Okay. Uh, so this is enacting a, a kind of togetherness right now, right? But um, to work with a lot of the Kala Chakra stuff and even simple ones, um, it's like, you know, trying to, of course, learn how to play Chopin. <laughs> anybody, anybody's trying to play that. Uh, the, um, the idea, just briefly, is um, uh, the idea of royalty is, is around a certain kind of sovereignty, um, not like a, a top-down thing, but the idea is that we're we're totally taking responsibility for our own lives and our own power and willing to be seen. So uh, that's why the teachers at Lamas are put up, but not because we're higher, but to be seen. So royalty or aristocracy, the best way is for the, uh, the Aryas, the noble ones who are showing, uh, demonstrating and saying, well, I'm out here. So trying to walk the talk like that. So there's, uh, there is some value, you know, that, you know, sometimes I must admit, I, I, I literalize on it. I follow the, the English monarchy with kind of like, can't they get it together? You know, but, but it's just like any other family, right? So. Okay, so we, should we close? Have any unanswered? Oh, does that mean yes? Okay, all right, okay. This is just because I like you. I'm breaking a rule here, okay. For, it's for us <laughs> visual people. Okay. Um, visual, visually obsessed people like me. Could you talk about the circle, center, circle, and circumference in relation to the model up there? I'm just kind of curious, like, I know the center is probably the little guy in the middle, and then there's these little squares around there, and then there's a circle, and then there's actually an area outside the circle. So, From a visual point of view, of course, there has to be a center, and uh, actually the, the model palace is square, so you have this interesting kind of alchemical squaring of the circle thing going on, but um, the, the real center is how it all relates. It's one big relationship. But uh, we're looking at an aerial view and yes, the Buddha Kala Chakra is in the center. And uh, actually, I didn't bring out the Kala Chakra poster, but then the, there are four gates on the side. And you enter through you enter through gates, and each gate represents a kind of a sense that we turn into like a Buddha family. So there's a journey through the mandala. You're meant it's meant to be dynamic, like you're walking, you know, through through a labyrinth somewhat. Okay. okay. <laughs> hey, you know, like Tom Hanks said in League of Your Own, if it was easy, everybody would do it. So, so let's do our closing. Due to the Buddha merits of these virtuous, virtuous actions, actions, when I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha, and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state, 
May the supreme jewel, bodhicitta, that has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chanrizik Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Sang, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvar, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Drakpa, I make requests at your holy feet. Announcements. I didn't forget. Yes. Um, Anybody have announcements? Uh, Autumn, would you, or Susan? Hi. Um, so I am leading with Susan's help the Sakadawa celebration, Buddha's birthday, which is June 12th two Sundays from now, and um, gratefully accepting any offers of help. Um, we're going to be having a meeting on Wednesday about it, and after Wednesday, I'll be creating a plan and uh, asking people for specific things. So everyone who's signed up, that's what we're waiting for, is that last bit of instructions that I'll be receiving soon. But if anyone else would like to help with setup or um, food or anything else, um, talk to me. Can I say announcement too? Yeah, Thursday group. Oh, so on Thursday, uh, we started a new meditation group. To, we're like um, every day of the week, practically, we have meditation in different. Uh, different groups so that everybody can attend one of them if they wish to. But on Thursday, it's a new group. It's called, um, uh, it's a bodhicitta meditation group and it's at 6 p.m. Um, however, we might change that to 7 p.m. So if you haven't signed up for the ROAR, um, there's a sign up sheet and I encourage you to sign up because you can keep track of all the different things we offer. And, um, and beyond that, uh, um, I, I just wanted to uh, mention something that we just uh, had on Friday. It's called Expressions. And I know some of you have attended, but some of you maybe haven't had an opportunity. But Expressions is uh, um, held between 6 and like 8.30. And we come together with food, poetry, music, um, art. And this last Friday, it was so amazing. And I just encourage you to come on the last Friday of the month because uh, it's just... Um, it, it's just like the, just like this uh, mandala. It's like we're welcoming our community into our space, and um, they are sharing uh, what's going on within them. And this last time that we came together, they really there was so much spontaneous sharing from the heart of poetry and music. For example, this young one one woman that struck me in particular. She uh, was Native American, and she sang a song in honor of her grandmother in her in her language, and. Uh, so anyway, I hope I've said enough about it that it makes you want to come to. Thank you. Um, I have one. So uh, I, I like to offer as many things as possible because I know people have commitments. So it's not necessary to go to every single group, you know, but uh, I am thinking about um, having a, a Tuesday night group uh, again uh, that uh, uh, looks at the, uses both uh, Dharma and psychotherapy uh, viewpoints and techniques along with meditation. Um, the, the group ended uh, um, a few years ago uh, and I'm interested in uh, seeing if there's uh, groundswell to bring it <laughs> bring it up again. Uh, uh, so people want to express later it's like, oh yeah, we, we might be interested in that. Um, you know, mostly for uh, 
you know, new people too, right? So like, not just people here, but you know, for people that are coming in through a portal of just humanistic portal and, um, you know, want to be able to um, use whatever therapy training or therapy they've had and integrate that somehow with uh, Dharma. And um, I, um, then I, I might be able to get Sabrina to help me lead it too. <laughs> if I do it at seven o'clock. So that I, I've also, that's, I have a personal mandala agenda also like that. Yes, sir. Um, Hi, Tom. I don't know. I can't promise that because okay. I'm kind of, I'm not uh, totally not good with that and neither is Sabrina or Colleen or anyone right. that might be doing it, but um, maybe. I only ask because I, I either had to, I had to Uber here today, yeah. but usually it's my daughter that gives me all of my rides. Okay. But she actually sent me money so I could get That's here. That's sweet. All right. We like your daughter. So, um, you know, uh, as the ending, we're going to have, uh, we have some snacks and, um, you know, please, uh, you know, say hi to somebody that you haven't met before, you know, like, um, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we go to mass with Sabrina and, you know, you just turn around and greet people, but we're not, we're not infused, it's a little hard in the chair. So, you know, please, um, you know, say hi to somebody you haven't said hi to for a while or you don't know. Okay. Capiche? All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat>